Um, I'll just sort of start by um, re recapping. So uh, I, I was in um, psychiatry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just forgot about one important thing. I will share the handout oh, of the talk, which is more detailed than the uh, than the PowerPoint. I'm going to do it right now on the chat. Okay. So okay. everyone, if you open the chat, you can download. Apologies, and you, you, you can be here. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. So I'll just start with, with, with the introduction. So I was in um, psychiatry for 34 years. Uh, 26 of those years, I was working with an understanding of psychodynamic practice, um, in particular, attachment theory and attachment research. There's possibly hundreds of thousands of papers on attachment theory research. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing for you this evening is to go back and forth between attachment, uh, psychotherapy practice, uh, epistemic trust, which is a current hot topic um, in trying to understand adult psychopathology. And I'm also going to go over in brief um, some major Freudian terms, which then connect up with these topics. Um, so that's how I'm going to do it. Uh, just to be clear, what I'm going to be saying this evening is just a brief overview of explaining what attachment theory is. It's effectively um, the study of love in between particularly parents and children, and then hence love in a broader sense of um, liking uh, between adults um, it covers um, marriage and partnerships and also has some um, commonalities with friendship, long, particularly long-lasting friendships. And I'm going to, towards the end, go into further um, comments on epistemic trust in society and other things like that. And the major impact that I'd like to get over is to say how these things apply uh, in practice, and I'm going to be making some recommendations um, that I picked up for, across my years of practicing. So let's start with a definition of epistemic trust itself. So epistemic trust is the degree of willingness to accept information from specific other people. And in the context of psychotherapy, um, it's that there are, I'm only going to be talking about two individual therapy with two people in it. Um, there are a number of overlapping terminologies, all of which could be quite confusing, but to say it very simply, um, a client is a care seeker, uh, could be a patient. Uh, it is the general public. And in the particulars of research, we're talking about children in one fixed format, and in another one, um, it could be adults who are seeking care from another person. Um, the I'm going to use the word therapist, also mental health worker. Um, these are caregivers, they're in the role of being a carer. Um, for research, it could be a parent that is the caregiver. It could also be a, a babysitter or a trusted um, close person within the family or other family members, could be grandparents, aunts and uncles. Um, it's also sometimes carers and caregivers are called attachment figures. These are all equivalent terms, so please don't be confused by the different words you may see when you read this literature. Within two people, to try and make it a very tight definition, um, the truster, person A, trusts person B, the trustee, to do something. And in the context of psychotherapy and other types of mental health care, they expect um, to receive the care and to be looked after. So that's my basic definition. Um, we all, we've all s seen and heard a little bit about Freud. Um, I'm going to go over some of the basics of his ideas 
and then I'm going to weave these in with the topics I've just mentioned a minute ago. So Freud himself didn't solely invent psychotherapy from scratch. He took um, influence from Pierre Janet and Jean-Martin Charcot on the importance of trauma and also the importance of childhood. He created his fundamental rule, which is a, a division of labor between the therapist and the client. He got this from his patient, Elizabeth von R, who gained both relief and understanding when she talked about her feelings and her situation. She called it chimney sweeping. Um, he took notice of the benefit that she received and he came up with the fundamental rule, which is that for clients, they should free associate, which means talking about the feelings and the situation without any let or hindrance. Um, for the therapist, the psychoanalyst, therapist listens to a person like listening to music. It's an openness and allowing themselves to be caught up and to be influenced by what the person is describing. Two other major topics that he came up with are transference, which in general is the transference of feelings and images from childhood and particularly childhood um, carers to people in general and in therapy, particularly to the therapist. Uh, resistance has a very specific meaning uh, for Freud. So resistance is resistance to free associating. It has a slightly broader meaning of resistance to talking in particular and it can also be understood as a very specific form of social anxiety where because uh, shameful and embarrassing things may be discussed it is because of the sense of shame that comes with the topics that the person wouldn't say them. Also for some people if they are talking the truth about what they feel their self-esteem might be lowered because they're speaking the truth and for these reasons um, for some times, people don't uh, talk about what they've, um, what they've come for. I had a person once, he said he, uh, he needed help with uh, a traumatic experience. So I agreed to see him. Um, I asked him about five or six times, was he ready yet to talk about the traumatic experience? Session 18, he was able to talk about it, but it took him all that time to pick up the courage to uh, begin to talk about it. The other thing that Freud um, realized is something called unconscious communication, which is a very specific um, and unusual thing, which if you're open to, you can be prepared to hear that people uh, who you're helping are talking about you. So if they think, they mention someone else who's a bumbling helper, who's made some mistakes, and you've made those mistakes. They're actually talking about you. So it's a disguised communication on your attempts to help them. Now, why I'm raising these things is I would suggest that all types of help, particularly those that have um, a time for free discussion in them, are much more able um, for people to go off on a tangent. They go off uh, on their own course. Um, and even those types of therapy, which are cognitive behavioral therapy, which are very task focused, if there is a spare minute or so, people may well go off on a tangent and start telling you things which are relevant to their situation. Um, and also, I would say, under the heading of talking about Freud, that he was not against uh, the practice of skills in order to help people. He saw the composer um, Gustav Mahler. Mahler was um, very worried about getting back into conducting again. And Freud's advice was, well, what you really need to do is to get a bit of practice, and that's what's going to help you. So just to say that, those are the points that I'm bringing up that are relevant and uh, do exist 
in all types of helping, uh, formal psychotherapy, other types of care that's provided to people. And what Freud began, um, which has later been proven, is the importance of early life and particularly trauma uh, in development. When there's been damage to children, and I'm talking about rape, uh, attempted murder, um, violent attack on small children, when that happens to very young children, particularly under age three, what may happen is um, it's the beginning of lifelong severe difficulties for those people as adults. Okay, so this is John Bowlby. Um, he was a psychiatrist uh, who began to do an awful lot after the Second World War, so that's 1945 onwards, and there were a lot of children who had lost their parents due to bombing. Um, for him, he was um, very embracing of um, qualitative research. Um, I wouldn't want to call him a phenomenologist, but he was certainly um, related um, and wanted um, psychology and the human sciences to be focused on tangible phenomena. He made a very large number of recommendations about how to practice um, child uh, development, uh, mourning and loss in children as important. Um, and he made a number of recommendations about how to practice, and I'll be going on to those uh, towards the end. Uh, this is Mary Ainsworth, who, with her colleagues, she's an American psychologist, in 1978, um, she identified three child um, attachment patterns between, it's usually the mothers and the children, and what happens um, in her fixed format, it's called the strange situation procedure, is usually it's a small child and their mother and a female experimenter in a fixed format uh, experiment where the mother leaves the room twice and returns twice. Now, what's of interest and what gets measured is the, there's a score of the degree of the child's avoidance with their mother on reunion and also a score of the degree of separation anxiety when the mother leaves. And that is the core of how um, the si strange situation procedure works. So uh, what I would recommend is that um, for dependable, good quality research in this area, there are three fixed formats in particular, which are um, particularly trustworthy. So the, the strange situation procedure, which was from 1978 onwards, the adult attachment interview, which tries to um, assess the degree of coherence that a person can talk about their important relationships with their parents. And what this means is it's um, not, that would be not um, repeated claims that the person can't remember the childhood. Um, and also if the person is asked, what was it like with your mother? And they say, okay, that's not an adequate answer to such a, an important question. If anything, um, that would need further prompting as to find out what's behind that and to keep to elicit more um, detail from them. The other term here, longitudinal studies, what that means is studies across the life course, so repeated, um, repeated assessment of the same person as they age, say every decade, going across the life course. Um, and what this supports is the hypothesis that childhood is enormously influential. And this has gained a consensus conclusion that attachment patterns from childhood are reliable 
and accurate representations of the care actually provided to those people as children. So what I'm going to give you now is then an overview of four childhood patterns. I have to say there is a fifth pattern which is just unclassified. This gets very little attention, but there is a fifth one. Uh, I'll start with the, um, the first three. So because of prior experiences of successful care being provided, children are willing to return to their care givers, their mothers usually, uh, when they encounter threat. So in the strange procedure, there is very mild threat. The child is left alone with a stranger. Um, the mother's out of the room, it's just a mild threat. And what is noticeable is what's called the secure base. If there is threat for a child, the child retreats to their mother or father and gets some uh, support, reassurance, they're soothed, um, they're comforted, and they can go back to playing again. Now, altogether, what this sets is uh, a very interesting basis. So one way of looking at childhood is that children leave their parents for small degrees, then they go to nursery school, then they go to further schooling, then they go to university, and then they go off and live somewhere else. So what you've got is an increasing amount of distance across a long period of time. So what Secure Base is about is that with trusted uh, other persons, if there is a threat, you can go to that person and gain some reassurance from them. And that's what the central phenomenon is uh, of called the secure base. Secondly, there's an anxious pattern, sometimes called anxious ambivalent or anxious preoccupied. Because these children have received unpredictable care that is insufficient, possibly inconsistent, uh, they feel they need to use large signals to try and elicit some care from that person. In the strange situation procedure, they may cry prior to separation, um, resist the separation, cry throughout the separation, explore the room very little. When the mother comes back, um, they may be angry and protest and when the mother tries to console them they cannot be consoled so you could understand that as a sort of lack of forgiveness or an attempt to uh, express anger that they've been left so that's what separation anxiety is about and if you compare the two between security and anxious what you see is that because the person's anxious, or the child is anxious rather, there's little or no exploring, where in the secure one, the child is free to go and play with the toys and to explore the room. So that sets a template for a future action. There is then thirdly, an avoidant pattern. Um, because these children have received minimal care and the quality of care could be intrusive, they gain the general expectation that other people cannot or will not uh, provide care for them. In the strange situation procedure, they do not seek proximity uh, before the separation and focus on the toys in the room and not the carer, their mother. Um, potentially, they may have received scorn for expressing their legitimate needs, and as a consequence, they attempt to be self-reliant. Uh, that's totally impossible for small children. They cannot be self-reliant. So the learning here is that children need to repress their, their own needs and repress the distress that they feel in order to maintain what is a minimal and has to be said rather neglectful and low quality type of uh, parenting. And what's interesting is that if you compare then the avoidant to the secure, what you see is that there is uh, the mother can come back to the room 
and the child doesn't turn around. There's no, there's no greeting. Um, after 1986, there was then the acknowledgement, a consensus acknowledgement that was then a fourth major pattern could be observed. Um, and what further research shows in the area that either sequentially or simultaneously, these children are, have been frightened by the carer. And when the mother returns, they begin to go towards her and they stop. Either they fall down, they go totally blank, or they freeze. And this one co-occurs with the first three. And um, potentially, not always, but potentially, there may have been uh, abuse or fear, or they are somehow frightened of the person who also provides them care. Um, I'll just give you a few overviews from the research literature in relation to these. So, um, adults who have suffered sexual abuse are found to be anxious, avoidant and disorganised or unclassifiable. Uh, prisoners um, who have perpetrated a violent crime are also found to be of those three same sorts. Uh, male uh, perpetrators of domestic violence and partner violence are also of the insecure, the, the same three insecure sorts. So because what I'm citing is probabilistic uh, correlational data, I'm not saying that the, the patterns cause these effects, however, People who have had those types of childhoods uh, are shown to, um, unfortunately, uh, fall into the categories of male offenders, uh, prisoners, and um, may possibly have suffered severe abuse when they were little. Talk a little bit now about adults. Um, so the fixed format here is an adult attachment interview where you have to have a trained interviewer so it takes it's rather involved as an interview process and what I'm going to give you now is just the sort of overview of what the findings are so for secure adults um, they do seek proximity with other people and they do have a secure base in adulthood um, they seek um, suitable trustworthy other people and they can go to professionals and ask for help. Um, it's okay for them to self-disclose, even if what they're talking about is shameful, embarrassing, and really difficult to talk about, which shows in Freud's terms, they have some resistance, but it's quite low. So, um, uh, they seek, seeking help from other people is then seen as a mature problem-solving um, process. The in, in ordinary life, this is the long term happy marriage or long term um, ha happy friendship that keeps on going. You can talk about anything, um, people can make mistakes and they can come back and the relationship is is ongoing and difficult things can be addressed. For anxious adults, um, they potentially may demand attention from other people and be extremely concerned and impatient to receive care from others. They may possibly be distrusting of adequate help. So when they are given help and it's not as fast or as somehow as perfect as they expected it to be, that then that leads to criticism. Also, uh, research shows that people with the anxious pattern are acutely um, sensitive to nonverbal cues of, of various sorts, which would then lend them to think that they're not liked or they're rejected or that they draw a bad conclusion, even if just for one fraction of a second, the person pulls a slightly strange face or they look at their watch and think, oh, what's the time? And that's read as, oh, he doesn't like me, I'm boring, and they don't come anymore. So, um, 
for anxious people, um, I had once a, a person who I hadn't met yet got their doctor to ring me up and say, oh, such and such is coming next week. But whatever you do, you cannot talk about their childhood with them. Please don't do that. And when you read into that, what they've been, the person's been thinking it through already. And uh, even before we've met, they're saying, there are certain things that I'm terrified of. Please come, don't talk about these things. So what happens with anxious adults is they may um, be receiving adequate help from a totally competent uh, carer, uh, therapist, yet they're open to the idea that what they're receiving isn't good enough somehow. Um, in, also in adulthood, this is the couple who get together very, very quickly. Um, some couples may get engaged on the first date. I've heard that before. This is also characterized in a stormy marriage. The couple stay together, but they're always arguing about something or other. Um, the marriage is ongoing. Uh, for avoidant adults, the problem here is that their childhood has taught them to downrate their own attachment needs, to feel close to other people. Uh, the family may have given it some sort of negative value, um, particularly around discussing emotions uh, seen as um, weakness, um, disapproval of intimacy with other people, or if someone expresses um, liking or desire to see them, it's heavily criticised. <clears throat> so distress and disclosure are avoided here. Um, and another consequence is that some topics may never ever have been discussed. So the consequences of the problem here are that if the person hasn't voiced a problem, uh, there may be a whole load of consequences because of that. Um, one example of it in adult life is the dead marriage or the marriage where they're so emotionally dis distant that if a uh, couple's having an argument, one of the partners falls asleep during the argument. Or another one is there's a couple uh, they don't live in the same city, they live 300 kilometres apart, and they only see each other once a month. One of them says to the other, oh, um, would you like to come um, next fort next week or next fortnight? And the response is, oh no, this is too demanding, I can't, I can't bear this, they, they want too much of me, I, I, I can't take it. So that's what an avoidant adult would be like. For disorganised adults, would be confusion, unclear, contradictory behavior. Uh, they might be angry and defensive. Um, these people may have had a bad childhood. It's not always the case, but they may well have had a bad childhood. They may have suffered trauma. And to throw out another finding from research is that all people who have suffered physical attack as adults, 50% of them, go on to be somewhat paranoid and fearful and hypervigilant just to the mere possibility that could, there could be another attack. So right now, I'm gonna to, to turn that around and say, well, how does this help us help people help the general public? So for secure people, secure adults, um, approximately, uh, approximately between 50 and 80% of the population of, of the world are quite easy to help. So they're quite likable. They would be moderately um, able to self-disclose. Uh, there's a low level of resistance in comparison to other types. They do feel shame and embarrassment about what they're talking about. It may well momentarily or longer reduce their self-esteem in order to get across what they need to say. Um, but just to state the obvious, um, that that reticence and that difficulty does need to be overcome in order to deliver a service properly. For anxious adults, 
they may want to control and limit the discussion of particular topics. Um, they may reject totally able services and specific therapists, um, even if there's been only one small nonverbal communication. Um, so that's the problem there. With avoidant adults, um, the, the finding is that in, if, you, if you have a short-term service, which could be 20 sessions or less, then there's pressure to get going and to get on to get onto the topics we need to go on uh, in a public health system or even in a private therapy. Um, they're spending money in a private situation, but um, if they're not really presenting or they have extreme difficulty in presenting what they, they won't help with, you know, for, the, for the worker, the therapist, we need to help them uh, engage properly and ex potentially explain to them um, what's going to be required in getting help. For disorganized adults, um, potentially um, what goes with trauma uh, is the possibility of suicidality or psychosis, particularly in for those who have suffered uh, sexual abuse as small children. If they do have suicidal feelings, it would be good to have a thorough personalised care plan, which would write with them by sitting down and asking them what will really help them if they are suicidal. And also, legally speaking, if you're going to recommend another service for suicide, you have to know that that's a good quality service, as you would for anything. Legally speaking, if you recommend a poor quality service, they could come back to you and effectively sue you because you recommended a, a, <clears throat> an unhelpful type of service. Okay, so let's go towards epistemic trust. So I'm going to come, come to it and go away from it and come back to it. So currently, um, this is a hot topic in several centres throughout Europe. Um, in the UK, it's led by the Anna Freud Centre in London under the leadership of Peter Fonagy and colleagues. Um, I hope that I've shown so far that prior relationships, and particularly those from childhood, um, do influence the course of adult life. And in the heading of epistemic trust, so trust as an openness is to benign trustworthy sources, which would mean qualified therapists, um, qualified um, psychologists and psychiatrists and others who are accredited in some way. And that um, if people ask you about your um, qualifications, then please do be open with them. Um, in the UK, all psychologists, uh, counsellors and psychotherapists have to be in supervision, which means taking your cases to um, a trusted senior colleague who can help you um, process the feelings and understand the feelings that come up with helping people. Um, so what we're talking about is that therapy requires self-disclosure and proper presentation of the problems and that telling the truth will um, allow people to feel the full impact of the emotional impact, and the emotional meaning of what's happened to them. And so by talking about it in detail, it's to be only to be expected that they're going to start feel uh, some of the original distress. In terms of epistemic mistrust, which is the second item here, is mistrust given to trustworthy sources and a rejection of um, trustworthy ones. Uh, epistemic credulity is almost the opposite of that. So there's then a lack of appraisal of the source of trustworthiness and trust given to factually false claims. Um, unfortunately, um, sometimes when people are invested in things 
that uh, they believe in, which unfortunately, factually speaking, are false. It's almost like um, um, a, a sort of delusional belief where, which is not open to discussion. It's not open to seeking proper evidence. It's not uh, a, open to rational inquiry. And there's an uncritical acceptance of what I would call an ideological false belief without evidence. Um, in this modern age, uh, young people in particular, I uh, mean under 30, um, may use uh, the internet to self-diagnose. Uh, this is referred to amongst medical staff here as um, seeing Dr. Google, where they've just looked something up and 99% of the time that they have um, misdiagnosed themselves. So, so what I'm going to do now is talk about how to apply these things and how to take it forward. So I would suggest that the therapist's responsibility is to assess thoroughly before making any commitment to upper sessions. And what I have in mind here is that there's worth in increasing safety in a very real sense in order to gain the trust of the other person. And it means that you're taking them seriously. So the therapeutic purpose is to increase the possibility of a secure process, or at least to help people um, by preempting um, what you could expect from some um, basic understanding of what's going on from and the necessities, and to preempt what I would call a dropout just to explain what I mean by that. If people start attending and then suddenly they cease to attend um, and you send them a letter or a questionnaire or you ring them up, it's highly unlikely you're going to get a response. So this leads to two major problems. Firstly, there's a sort of complaint implied as to why they're not coming anymore, but there's no possibility of inquiry. So you can't find out why they're not coming anymore. Um, and you can't put whatever maybe you've personally contributed to that in some way. Uh, you can't put it right. And so you can't help them. And there's an, a frustration in trying to help them as they're not they won't respond um, to your letters or phone calls. Also, um, being with people who've suffered trauma and particularly sexual abuse, um, rape uh, in childhood, uh, will bring up strong feelings for you. Um, some people um, who you see, um, who um, uh, the technical term is called managing the counter-transference. That just means managing how you feel about meeting with them. Um, so I would suggest that um, if you get strong feelings about meeting with people, that you should take them to your supervisor and talk them through to try and understand and then work out how to act on them. If you find you have a dilemma about how to help them, then I would also suggest you speak with them about how to help them and say, uh, explain the problem to them and um, seek their uh, their um, their input and their view of how to go forwards. Um, one way of helping people is to give them uh, an assessment tool which um, scores risk, in particular self-harm, uh, suicidality and risk to other people. And on the hand handout, it's called Core 34. It's a, it's a non-copyrighted um, assessment tool, which is very good at capturing risk. Um, we did some unpublished research at um, my last employer. What we found out was that people are much more likely to tell the truth of their suicidality on a questionnaire rather than to their worker. And therefore, to um, provide safety for people who might be suicidal, but unwilling to talk about it, it's another step in trying to grasp uh, the difficulty and to provide safe care for them. Uh, 
I would suggest to people that you don't have to try and like the public if you're thorough. Uh, you will find something like about, about them, even if you can realise that there's some part of them that's rather prickly. Um, so um, if you're thorough with assessment and clear in what you're offering, and also potentially uh, flag up any difficulties that you can see, then that's going to help you. So now back to John Bowlby. Uh, John Bowlby recommended that there should be preemptive management of the relationship, particularly absences. Now, absences could be for you or for them. Um, so if you know you're going to be absent because you're sick or you're pregnant or for any other reason uh, that you're going to be off work and you're that person's worker, we need to set it up beforehand to tell them when you're off and when you come back. So to expect in advance that um, what you're doing is um, valuable to them if they're coming, to expect they would be upset in your absence. And when they get back, they may actually still be upset, but they don't want to talk about it. So if you can, if you can foresee that, you're going to smooth it over. Um, okay, so uh, how to get to trust is, I would suggest, by being um, open to these types of possibilities and that to be trustworthy um, will help um, clients get the care that they're coming for. Um, so um, another aspect would be... Um, how to um, um, potentially even some of these topics may be worthwhile writing on a piece of paper so that you can physically give them a piece of paper about how to postpone a session, how to ring you up if you're ill, um, and to deal with it like that. Um, also, if there are any complaints, those should be dealt with during the meetings and not after. Um, it's much um, also when it comes to the end of the first few meetings is to have a few minutes of a debrief, something like, oh, how was it this morning? Um, what do you think to coming here? Which would just open it up and give them some chance to say how much they like it. If they say, oh, it's great. That's, again, not an adequate answer. What do they like about it? Is there anything they don't like about it? Please, please tell me. Also, if you're going to do trauma-focused work, um, I would suggest you need to possibly have sessions longer than 50 minutes. Uh, 90 minutes might be okay, and have a cool down time. If you're gonna be talking about trauma with people, it's highly likely they may have strong flashbacks, they may dissociate, uh, they may start reliving the experience of the trauma in the room with you. And sometimes um, it may also be necessary to have uh, a blank time if you're going to have a session that's totally focused on the trauma because you don't know what their reaction will be beforehand. Um, so the other technical terms you may see in the literature are the, the terms secure frame and held to feel held so to try and wrap that up what i'm talking about here is that it's a professional duty i would suggest for the therapists to hold the clients and then that the supervisors and the organization holds the therapists and what that does if all parts of the organization are working in um concord that um, that will be a good quality service. If you're part of an organization where you know that the, there, there is um, specialist workers who deal with people who are suicidal, but they're extremely lackadaisical, then um, it um, may be highly problematic. Um, Let's go back to epistemic trust and see it in the context of society. Um, in America, 
um, in recent times and current times, uh, there was a president elected uh, to drain the swamp. Uh, unfortunately, he's just increased the depth of the swamp, and if anything, he is the swamp. Um, reality and trustworthiness in politics, uh, it seems to me, to be going in a totally different uh, direction where false accusations are put forward designed to spread doubt, uh, social division and promote social exclusion. I find this um, disturbing in the extreme. Also, in society, epistemic trust in relation to science, um, as we see with anti-vax um, campaigners and such like, is that people who know nothing about science are able to uh, criticize it and put forward um, false ideas about what a vaccination is about. Um, epistemic credulity in this sense is um, a problem in so much that people should beware of false prophets and beware of ideologies without um, a factual basis. Um, there should be a warning with belief that believers need to beware. Also, under the heading of attachment and employment, I see a parallel in so much that um, an organisation that offers a tenure of a job contract is offers a real reason to be committed to that employer. There are some organisations that offer a zero hours contract there is no real reason to be committed to that employer. It's, it's, it's not secure. And in relation to how a, a service is managed and what it looks like from a management perspective, and I just raise this as a sort of open question. From a managerial perspective, if you saw that a number of your colleagues were seeing people, but they had extremely high dropout rates. It seems to suggest that there's something not quite right there. On the other hand, if you saw, uh, say, 40 people over a year, and only one of them dropped out prematurely and didn't respond to your letters and phone calls, then that wouldn't be too bad. Um, the next point on the slide is from research that 95% of the public can be helped by psychotherapy. Unfortunately, 5% deteriorate across the course of the meetings. And if you're giving monthly or weekly scores, you can see how they deteriorate. Also, people who have stressful events going on in their lives, uh, divorce, court appearance, while they're in psychotherapy, you'll see their uh, risk and distress going up at the same time. So you're not the only influence. There could be a whole load of other things that are going on for them. Um, and we would like to help people who have been sexually abused um, and raped as children. If, however, they have been psychotic in previous therapies, um, it's likely they may become psychotic in current therapies as well. So um, if that's the case, it could be well worth uh, trying to prepare the way with them explicitly and discuss um, how to proceed in that situation. For people who have been sexually abused, they often find it extremely difficult to assert themselves. Uh, the logical uh, logical way of thinking about these things is you just teach them assertiveness skills. Unfortunately, uh, that's not how they may experience being helped. Uh, for some people who have suffered multiple uh, rapes, particularly in childhood, they might experience that. And that um, as uh, you putting pressure on them. And secondly, just the mere mention that they could, uh, should, uh, assert themselves with other people might possibly bring on a psychosis for them. They're not used to it. Um, so, um, what I would put over to um, people is about uh, providing real safety with people, assessing thoroughly, uh, and trying to preempt problems to provide 
um, good quality care. And then even uh, in final um, comments, um, there are four attachment patterns in childhood. Uh, these remain as four attachment process between adults. There is a similar character to them. Uh, attachment itself um, is part of being human being and particularly uh, a mammal. Mammals um, um, are, are, are the only creatures that have attachment and have um, meaningful relationships with their parents. Um, the quality of close relationships is immensely important. And um, childhood uh, is um, very important on the quality of adult life. And as far as epistemic trust goes, it is a current topic um, in Europe about trying to find uh, and understand what um, about trust and in relation to adult psychotherapy. So uh, that's it, thank you. That's all I have to say for this evening.